And so to our panel, um, in alphabetical order, uh, Minette Batters, president of the National Farmers Union. Uh, Minette will be well known to all of you. Uh, Minette's a successful livestock farmer and she is now in her second term as the NFU president. I would say Minette has arguably had the hardest portfolio of issues to deal with of any recent pres president and probably going back much further. I'm sure we can all agree that those issues could be in no better hands. Our second panelist is Professor Sir Charles Godfrey. Uh, Charles is currently director of the Oxford Martin School, which looks in depth at major global issues, including food supply and a changing environment. He has chaired the Foresight Project on the Future of Food and Farming, and is currently chair of DEFRA's Science Advisory Council. He is also a trustee of Rothenstead Research. Uh, and I'm sure you all know that's the oldest uh, research institution of its kind in the world. Our third panelist, Darren Moorcroft, Dr. Darren Moorcroft, sorry, Chief Executive of the Woodland Trust, the largest woodland conservation charity in the country with the aim of creating, protecting and restoring our wonderful woodlands. Uh, it has over 500,000 members and supporters and Darren is also on the BBC's Rural Advisory Committee which I think advises the archers amongst other things. Uh, our fourth panellist and final panellist is Ian Wright, Chief Executive of the Food and Drink Federation. Uh, the FDF is the representative voice for companies and trade associations across the whole of the UK's food and drink industry. And uh, before this, Ian held senior posts with Diageo, Boots and Mars. Lastly, but by no means least, our chairman for the evening is our own fragrant Fiona Bruce, uh, the master of the worshipful company of farmers, Richard Whitlock. Uh, Richard is well known to many in the industry for his various senior roles, particularly in the grain trade, where I remember listening to him in awe when he would expound on what the corn price was going to do in the future. Uh, not often, always right, but of course, there we are. Latterly for his involvement with many trade associations, the Oxford Conference and the East of England Agricultural Society. So that's me and I will see you at the end of the evening. Over to you, Master. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And we've had the introductions, so I'm going to go straight into the first question for our panelists. Does government and industry have the structures in place to ensure we deliver on reducing greenhouse gases while guaranteeing farmers a more productive and sustainable future? That question is a combination from Robert Sheesby, Sarah Orton and Richard Percy. And I think, Charles, that question was written for you, actually, wasn't it? Would you like to open? Thank you, Richard. Um, and the answer is not yet. Um, I think we are only really beginning to, to comprehend quite what a challenge it's going to be for the government, for the country to get to net zero. And it's something that's going to affect all sectors, uh, including the farming sector, um, uh, obviously. Uh, I think the next year is going to be really interesting coming up to the COP in Glasgow at the uh, next uh, uh, December. I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, I will compliment the NFU on their net zero policy, which I think is a great start in, in exploring some of these issues in this sector. Um, if, if I was to worry, it is that um, I, get, I, I don't think, we've made so many different commitments in land use that uh, affect um, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions that they don't all add up. So. I think we have to, in some in some sense, square some of the calculations that have been made, and, and I can see that happening. But that is 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 going to be difficult, and will quite and will take some time. But overall, I'm optimistic. I'm more optimistic after the American elections as well that there may be a an international consensus about what we have to do. Um, but don't anyone pretend that um, net zero is business as usual. It is going to make, mean radical changes both to, as I said, each industry, each industrial sector, and to us as individuals as well. 
Thank you. Um, Minette, you've set some uh, very challenging targets for the NFU. How are we going to achieve those? Well, in, in many ways, Richard, the, you know, ha having ripped up the old rule book, which, which we have under the CAP and designing a new agricultural policy, actually, you can deliver it all of it through the new policy. I mean, it is obviously different for, uh, for livestock, it's different sector by sector, but it is, it is all achievable. And I think the exciting thing for agriculture is we are a source of emissions, currently 10%. But we are a sink as well. So, you know, we are the one sector that actually can get to net zero um, without, we believe very strongly, or we would never have said it, without downsizing livestock numbers. Now, there's many ways that, that this can be done and the work going on at Harper, and I'm delighted that Michael Lee is now at Harper and leading on their sustainability work. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at feed additives, when you're looking at health status, when you're looking at genetics, all of these things, you know, make a, a massive difference in keeping a, a vibrant livestock sector that is impacting less. And that is the key point. You know, you are focusing on productivity, you're focusing on efficiencies. You are effectively producing more, but with less. So with less inputs, less damage. So it is actually, it's good for the business. It's good for the planet. And getting to net zero, Charles is, is absolutely right. And we should not underestimate the massive challenge that this is. It is a game changer, not, not just for us in business, but for society as well, because it, it does mean changes across the board. But the legislation is there. That was always my focus. The legislation is there. The Climate Change Act is in place. And so I would rather do it for farmers, incentivized with the right policies, as a real leadership, global leadership position for us, um, rather than look where New Zealand is at the moment um, with, with taxing farmers. Obviously, they're a much higher level of emissions. But you know, we've got a, a real opportunity to lead here. And what Charles says about Biden and the changes, them coming back in uh, to the, uh, the COP, um, China as well. We shouldn't underestimate China. I was asked to speak in November out in China on sustainability. China is now entering into this as well. And, and with, the, with those two, I think there is real opportunity because it, it's no good one country or even one trading block. Europe is on this journey after all. You know, we have to have international consensus on all of this. And this is where, of course, the work of Mars Allen is so important on, on how we account for greenhouse gases on, on a global uh, mechanism too but it's got to happen so it's it's a game changer but i think actually agriculture compared to other sectors is in a very very good place to achieve it darren have you got global reach with other car organizations throughout the world to make it so that it is a, a, a globally delivered challenge uh, absolutely and i think you know picking up from where where minette uh, left off i think one thing i would say is the uk has put itself in a leadership role in its rhetoric, it now has to turn that rhetoric into action. And the only way it will do so is to ensure that uh, we get the right solutions in on the ground. And you know the farming uh, community are gonna be crucial to that. I think one of the things I would say, in addition to what's been said already though, is uh, what we do know is net zero is tackling a climate change emergency. Uh, we also have a nature uh, ecological emergency and they are two sides of the same coin and what we can't afford to do is try to fix both of those separately. Uh, we need a way in which we can have a land use policy that delivers for both. Uh, we've got nature-based solutions, we've got technological solutions and we need to be able to deploy them uh, at a UK level but also then to uh, take inspiration from what else is happening uh, around the world and export our our knowledge base to uh, increase that around the world as well. Uh, Ian, there's things like sustainable soy, sustainable palm and that sort of thing. Do you think they're going, all the raw ingredients around the world are going to be sourced with that sustainable uh, credibility attached to them? I think, I think there are some hard yards as consumers and more importantly shoppers adapt to what can and can't be available as a consequence of uh, different nations, different markets, different companies 
adopting net zero targets within a particular time frame. So I, I don't think we should think, and I think other colleagues were saying this, I don't think we should think this is a, gonna be a relatively straightforward move. I think there will be some pain for shoppers and consumers and certainly for business. Um, but I think the positive is that you have a generation of managers now in, in certainly in the food and drink business. And I think beyond that actually in, in, in industry generally for whom this is now something that they assume must be done. There is, an there is a kind of a, a presumptive uh, view that this is uh, a must have objective in your business objectives. And if there isn't, your kids are gonna tell you, you must have it. And I've always thought that one of the biggest pressures that people have never properly understood is the power of people's kids when they're managing businesses. Um, and, you know, it was, it, I'm having been involved in managing both Boots and Diageo over 20 years, I know that those businesses reacted extremely quickly when um, senior management's children were telling them that there was something they didn't like. Um, and, or indeed, when so they tell him something they did like as well. And it isn't sort of mum and dad dancing, it is actually quite an important imperative because it, if it exists in your family, it tends to exist in your head and therefore you tend to do something about it. Um, I do think there will be consequences, but I'm, I'm reasonably confident that this is one kind of objective which, which businesses will adopt. I'm, I'm more worried actually, and I'm probably not a subject for now, but I'm more worried that one or other of the big industrial players, whether it's the EU, China or America, gets into the business of, if I can put it this way, weaponizing climate change in terms of particular economic advantage. And there are some dangers of that with solar power, where one, one, one particular economic block could get an advantage that becomes monopolistic. And that seems to me to be the bigger concern. And we've seen a bit of that, of what could happen with that in the last 48 hours with vaccine nationalism. You know, it must not become the case that the access to being able to hit net zero is somehow engaged in some sort of economic conflict. And I think that's the biggest concern I would have about this. But I'm reasonably optimistic about, about the, the ability to hit the target. That takes us nicely because this is an evolving thing. And if we look at the Agricultural Act that's going through, I'll just run through the next question then, because I think this takes us into that sort of place as to how we deal with it today. Does the panel have concerns about the changing emphasis from food production to environmental outcomes? How will planting more trees and not growing crops on high value land solve the problem? What is the right balance between farmland and woodland area? Does this create a paid opportunity for celebrities to buy land for rewilding? And will tenants rents fall? Those questions are from Richard Crane, Ben Parker, Colin Heron, Merrick Raymond, and Bob Goodrum. I think there's some trees in there, Darren, so that must be you for an opener, I'd imagine. Okay, uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, <laughs> I'll try and pick out the bits of those. There's quite a few questions in there. So um, I think headline terms, uh, I, you know, as you would expect me to say, I very much welcome the public funds for public goods. I think it's a a really strong message for uh, the public purse to be supporting land management, which gives the multitude of benefits that uh, society needs and uh, in some regards society wants. The, I think in terms of trees and the balance between trees and, uh, and land and food production, you know, with the Climate Change Committee has, so, has said that we need at least 17% woodland cover uh, up to two billion trees between now and 2050. Uh, they've got to go somewhere, but it will be a mix of uh, how we utilize land. So we know that on some of the grade one land, uh, trees can be integrated through very productive agroforestry mechanisms, which increase the productive capacity of that land um, and generates new markets, links into the food strategy, the national food strategy that's coming in terms of producing new types of uh, food to uh, influence and help with better diets. Um, but fundamentally, some landowners will want to shift wholesale out of what they're currently doing under the old system into 
into uh, creating woodland or other habitats. Um, and I think recognizing the value of those habitats and being rewarded to for doing so, I think is going to be incredibly important. I think one of the um, suggestions that has been said to me is that, and I don't think it's absolutely true, but I think it's something we need to be mindful culturally is farmers look down and foresters look up and they're <laughs> looking in the opposite direction when they're thinking about their land. I think, you know, we're not making any more land, so let's move into the space above it uh, with the right trees in the right place, creating the right habitats, creating the right food production, creating the right uh, systems that will benefit society. Uh, Minette, is that less meat then, if we're going to have less area to grow um, crops on to feed animals? There is no need for it to be less meat if, if we are more efficient in our production. And, uh, you know, one of the fantastic things about the UK is we have a maritime climate and we grow grass. So, you know, we have a lot of the privileges here that many parts of the world don't have. And I would add, we need to be growing a lot more of our fruit and vegetables as well. But the agricultural um, act is is a very different act to when it started its, its journey as as a bill under michael gove's time and i remember being on the today program and michael gove being asked well this is the environment bill it doesn't mention food it doesn't mention farming it doesn't mention soils and you look at it now and it is a fully formed agricultural act um a very different one measuring food security there'll be measurements this year it was going to be five yearly now it'll be done this year and in three years time we know this is a seven year transition. There'll be an election. I do think the next election will be absolutely pivotal on, on agricultural policy and on trade policy as, as well. But I'm gonna pick out a couple of things. Um, are we going to see more celebrities buying land? Um, and the tenant side of it, there is a real danger. Bizarrely, a lot of the opposition to direct payments was the fact that you know it could go to large landowners and they were deemed to be pulling down too much money and that needed to change. Well, actually this potentially could be much worse because you could have very large landowners who might not even be living in this country who are buying up land, pulling down money uh, to plant trees and other things and doing nothing for the goods for the market effectively, um, particularly around food production because we've lost the link to the active farmer role. So anybody can access these monies. So I think we've got to be really careful here because there is a danger at the next spending review that actually, you know, you look at this and you see, well, the vast sum of this money is going to very large wealthy landowners that are actually not contributing what we would like uh, to our economy. So I think that is a risk. I also think the tenanted sector, we really, really need to get clarity on the policy, on details on every aspect, but particularly for the tenanted sector. There is very little detail, Richard, of what lump sum means. Um, no idea on the tax implications yet, yet as to how people can leave the industry. We talk about the opportunities of planting trees. I think everybody is up for planting more trees, but of course, woodland has always been the preserve of the landowner, not the tenant. So what do trees look like for the tenanted sector? So there are a lot of questions to be answered, but one thing I'd finish with, it was a great privilege for me to be able to pull together all farming organizations, co-design a sustainable uh, farming, food and farming white paper proposal for DEFRA. And I'm delighted that you know, bear in mind a year ago, we weren't even talking about sustainable farming. Now we've got a sustainable farming initiative that is going to be piloted, that is going to be accessible in 2022. We know everything with a majority government is a long haul. It takes a long time to influence and you need to be speaking with a united voice as we found with the food standards campaign last year. And you need to be absolutely clear with meticulously worked up policy as to what it looks like, which is what we did. So I'm hopeful that by the time we get into 2022 and transition, um, that the policy will work. But there is a big watch point. This is a global first, it's never been done before. We are going to be open to much more um, impact with the trading nations like Australia, New Zealand. We will have many more raw ingredients coming onto our market. And we are massively changing from food production to environmental delivery. So, 
the proof will be in the pudding and my focus is on making sure that the public monies for public goods are focused on food production and paying for what the market isn't paying for which is why climate change delivering on carbon neutral food fits so well with a future policy thanks Lynette. charles do you want to add something yeah, so to, to me, the great challenge for the agricultural industry is to make certain that the 3.2 billion a year that currently goes into the sector from CAP stays in the sector because it's a very juicy target for Treasury to get at. And to me, the one argument that really um, genuinely uh, emphasizes the importance of staying in, in the sector is around public money for public goods. I think it needs to be a little bit more sophisticated than it is at the moment because there's some straightforward public goods around climate change, flood prevention. But as Manette has said, there are issues around animal welfare, which are not a simple public good. You can call them a merit good or something like that. So one needs to have uh, a conversation around that. Um, I, I think that the farming industry is mistaken if it talks about food as a public good. You can say food security is a public good. But I'm not sure that's going to get through the hard men at the Treasury. So again, uh, I think one has to be realistic about the arguments. I think it's again the point that, that, that uh, Manette made about tenancies, about equity, about levelling up. There are some real public goods there that again are a strong argument for, for keeping that, that money in, uh, in the sector. Um, just on issues around, um, it, it worries me a little bit that the arguments over meat get, get very polarised. And to me, the important thing is not that we produce the same amount of meat or the same, or, or the same head of cattle or, or, or um, other species, but that the people who owe their livelihoods to producing livestock at the moment still have good jobs. And I think that their uh, income sources will diversify, and that is a good thing. And I think one will see a, a far greater granularity uh, among uh, uh, farm businesses, with some more concentrated on the private goods and some more concentrated on the public goods. And I think there should be a quid pro quo within a regulatory uh, baseline. Then some of the some of the companies that are cons uh, some of the businesses that are concentrating on maximizing private goods should be less constrained perhaps than they are at the moment. And on the other side, those that are uh, farming in highly uh, sensitive environments, there might be more constrained. Okay, uh, Ian, I'm gonna pass on you because the next question evolved from there, but it's right up your street, I think. Um, discount supermarkets are significantly increasing their market share. Are the vast majority of consumers more concerned about price, taste and convenience than sustainability, welfare and Britishness? That's a question from Michael Dalton, Peter Collier and K Camilla uh, Simonowska. Ian. Yes. Um, uh, that is undoubtedly true. Um, and, um, you know, we have to get with a plan on that subject. Um, that doesn't mean they always will be. Um, and one of the things I, I, very kind of you actually to leave me out of the last one because I, I almost certainly had absolutely nothing to add except a massive demonstration of my ignorance. Um, but I mean, as someone who's lived in the rural economy all his adult life, I, I, have, I have a kind of um, observer's view, which is that um, I think it is really important not to try and pretend about this. I, I, I think it's important to note uh, that everybody will be changed as if, car if we are going to go to net zero and if everybody signs up to the Paris Accord, then everyone will be changing at the same time. And that means that there will be big implications, not just for the UK economy and the UK agricultural economy, but for all economies, they'll be different and people are starting from different places and they have different drivers of their, both of their, um, of their climate change and their environment objectives, but also of their consumer objectives. And the role of the consumer, or in my case, a, a very strong view that the shopper is massively more important than the consumer in all of this, because it's the shopper what makes the buying decisions. Uh, then I think, I think the answer to your initial question is yes, but, shoppers 
can come under pressure from other members of their family in the way I've just described earlier. And I think shop, I think there is a real chance of educating shoppers away from price as the single determinant. But I do think taste and attraction of the product is always going to be a, and we'd hope it would continue to be a massive driver of choice because otherwise provenance will know and and issues like the ethical nature of the production, uh, whether it's about animals, whether it's about the wages of those who are paid to produce something. If provenance isn't an important factor, then uh, we won't be able to exert the kind of pressure on some of the moral issues involved in the supply chain. So I think that that is very important. But look, we haven't driven down, and I'm not a necessarily an unalloyed fan of this, but and others, Charles and others would have had a, a will remember the fact, the actual facts here. Um, but my recollection is that in the 1950s, the amount of the household budget paid spent on food was somewhere over 50%. In the 1970s and 80s, early mid 70s, it was over 30%. Now it's 8%. So price is clear, it'd be rude, ridiculous, Knut-like or Knut-like to pretend that price wasn't a critical factor at the moment. And that's encouraged by the extraordinary nature of cutthroat competition during the, uh, in between our supermarkets. And the last thing I'd say on this is this, one of the unexpected and unlooked for uh, consequences of the COVID crisis and this is not a criticism of either the supermarkets or the government, but has been that supermarket power in the market has been elevated. Because when we started the crisis, we were in a situation where food consumption was 70% through retail, 30% through out of home. Now it's 95.5. And the vast majority of that 95 has been delivered brilliantly through uh, uh, convenience stores and they've done very well in this crisis both finan many financially certainly in terms of the reputation but do not be mistaken that the, 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 the supermarkets have also done extremely well and so it, it's in their DNA that price is a critical determinant and it will take time to educate and change opinion that other factors must play a part in your choice of A, which supermarket, and B, which price you pay. Uh, Minette, we've talked for ages about this, and it's just like the farmer buying his tractor or his nitrogen fertilizer. Price is a big determinant. So how can we turn around the factors of price, taste, and convenient and replace them with um, sustainability, welfare, and Britishness? Well, I think what we do know is that the British shopper wants it all. And to a certain extent, it's been a massive success story in that we've done it all. We've done it all. We have high welfare standards. We have high standards of environmental protection. We have probably the safest food system in the world now with our huge investment on back off. Don't, don't let's forget 20 years ago, the industry was on the floor. Our reputation was on the floor. The continual investment in our short, safe, secure supply chains has, has really paid off. And, and as Ian said, you know, it's only 8% of our income that we are investing in food. And so it's been incredible. If, if you and I look at our diets now compared to our diets 10, 20 years ago, the transition has been absolutely breathtaking, I think, on the quality and standards of food that we can buy now. But I think there are questions as to the long term sustainability of that, because those efficiencies at the farming and growing end have allowed prices to stay relatively um, static. I mean, if I look at what we were paying for strawberries 20 years ago, it's about the same as it was now. And yet that sector has been incredibly efficient. If we look at what we're paying for milk, it's the same as what we we're paying 20 years ago. So when we want extras piled in on here, how how does that work at the farm gate and i think one of the key things we need to know with net zero is what are the returns back to the farm gate on all of this because farmers have got to be able to get more out of the marketplace and climate change is is one that that really needs to show that so that's a piece of work that i would like to see done i i think what happens what ian's referring to we we 
certainly to start off with, we lived very differently out of retail to what we did when we were in our normal lives. You know, we had Nescafe with a splash of milk. We didn't have a fabulous lockdown cappuccino. And now, speaking to all the retailers, habits are changing. I mean, LD said they've never sold more lamb. Lamb sales are going like that. And people are now eating out of, you know, out of retail, to a certain extent, how they were out of home. But food has never been cheaper than it was in the run up to Christmas. You saw Tesco's, I think, massively trying to increase market share. The discounters are the discounters. They had to discount. The cost of online shopping hasn't really come into play yet. So I think this April added friction, friction equals cost with the EU UK uh, trade cooperation agreement. Food prices are going to have to rise uh, and, and you know, that will be driven by retail because it's unsustainable where we are. So the whole food system, Richard, in this country is, is under pressure, new policy, foreign owned processing here, massive investment here at the moment because the raw ingredients are here. And that is a key thing going forward to keep the raw ingredients here. Otherwise, does that foreign processing and manufacturing stay here? So lots of questions to be answered. OK, Darren, I'm going to pass it for you on you on this one. Just a closing piece on that, Charles. Anything else you want to say on that price? Yeah, it, value? It, it's really interesting. And the 8%, 9% statistic is fascinating. At no time since money was invented has a society spent less on food than we do at the moment. And sort of economics 101, if you bring in the, ex the externalities, then it all says food should be more expensive. But the real issue is that if one does, if one does that, then it's going to be the bottom 10% that suffers. And we see this with the Marcus Rashford campaign at the moment. So the food is almost being sort of held hostage to bigger economic agendas around inequality. Uh, and a very brief comment on Ian's really fascinating, um, uh, 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 what Ian said. Um, do not assume that the consumer can do all the heavy lifting in getting better carbon uh, intensive food, better environmental food. Certainly our research in academia, and I think the industry's research suggests that it, it is fairly limiting. But the point Ian you made about the children of a CEO making a difference, I think the real importance of um, the consumer is changing the public discourse around food so that it gets easier for the private sector to stand up to their shareholders to do something. And it's easier for the government to actually do the right thing without being terrified that the Daily Mail is going to uh, scream about the nanny state. Uh, Darren, if I can move the questioning on then, please, um, because this is in your camp. Will the government introduce bans, levies, or a carbon tax on food imports not produced to our environmental or welfare standard? And that is from Tony Alston, Richard Crane, and Richard Cooksley. I was asking you earlier about the global uh, impact. How do we do that? Because arguably what we're doing is we're pushing our problem overseas, aren't we? Well, I think one of the things that this government has done is to look at the sustainable uh, production, particularly if you take, you know, in my area of, of timber and looking at the impacts of take, trying to remove deforestation as an issue for our supply chains. Uh, so I think the short answer is uh, to, your, to the question is, um, I doubt that there'll be a carbon tax because I think it goes back to, uh, I think what the point that Ian was making around, you kind of have to do it, do it everywhere. Um, but I think there is going to be the incentives for land managers in the UK around carbon. And I think there is going to have to be uh, a regulatory framework for the businesses in the UK around carbon if we're going to meet uh, and have the leadership around net zero. So I think we're in a we're in a situation where uh, those who can uh, provide the carbon sequestration that society needs and that supply chains will be required, in my opinion, to in order to get to net zero. Uh, some of those supply chains won't be able to drive out carbon completely and therefore you're going to have to look at offsets but those offsets need to be quality offsets they don't they can't be um, the kind of uh, carbon market that we've seen uh, in the past of the of the 80s so I think we're looking at a new framework for how we support uh, land management how we su support uh, the supply chains that are feeding that 
plan management and what our expectation on businesses through regulation will be in how they will meet uh, net zero. And picking up Ian's point earlier, you know, what we see, you know, from our from our 500,000 plus supporters, it's the youngsters voice is getting louder and louder. And not only are they expecting from their parents uh, and families to do the right thing, they're expecting from society, they're expecting from their, their future employers. And whether those future employers are in agriculture or whether those future employers are in other, other sectors, if you're a business that's not looking like you are doing the right thing in sustainability terms, I think you won't be attracting the best of the best and you therefore will uh, be kind of overseeing a decline in your, uh, your position rather than an enhancement. Uh, Minette, the, the Prime Minister says this is global Britain and we're open for business. Does that mean we're going to open the doors to undercut the prices of your members? Well, this has been the, the focus uh, throughout last year of, of making the case for scrutiny and transparency of trade deals. The TAC, the Trade Agricultural Commission, uh, is now on the going to be on the face of the trade bill. The reporting process is in the Agricultural Act. Um, so we are, have got more transparency, which, which means that MPs will be able to have oversight and say on future trade deals in a way that they didn't with, um, as an example, the Japan deal. So that is, that is a big step in the, in the right direction. I, I think the big challenge with trade is we are a service-based economy. You know, we are 80% services, we are 20% goods. And we know that agriculture is the pawn in these trade deals. It is the last chapter to be decided. So Australia looks like being completed potentially by Easter, but certainly by the summer, you know, their cost of production in beef is, is 50% of ours. Um, you know, and if you listen to, to the Australians, they will say, you know, it's going to be great for the UK consumer because we can undercut the high cost of, of UK regulation. George Eustace committed, of course, um, to making sure there is restriction on that. The Australians adamant there won't be. So, Trade is really going to play out here and it's going to be a challenge. We already are. We're seeing it with oilseed rate, whereby we are importing uh, oilseed rape that has access to neonicotinoids. And we all know the challenge that we have had here recently with the beet sector. So this is, you know, this is the biggest game in town. And, and ultimately, farming's future here will be driven by trade. And if we insist on the terrifying thing is raising standards here, if you raise the legislation baseline and you allow in food that doesn't meet the bottom rung of the ladder, you really compromise our businesses. So it's, it's the most important thing to get right. Charles, you're close to government policy. Which way is the pendulum going to swing on this one? Oh, I wouldn't claim any insight into this. I, I would say I think Manette has been absolutely indefatigable over the last sort of couple of years raising the issue of trade and making certain that, that it, it's um, centre in government policy and things. And it's far from perfect at the moment, but it, I don't think it's been overlooked. Um, I, perhaps foolishly, a time for hope over experience, I still hope that it might be possible at some stage to implement a carbon tax that works and actually benefits the agricultural sector. Um, I am a pessimist when it comes to multilateral trade agreements. I am more optimist that we might be able to do things. Uh, and I'm now talking more on, um, on uh, climate change rather than standards, that we might be able to do things by major bilaterals. Of course, the paradox of having come out of Europe is that Europe being such a big market and willing to legislate or willing to, to set rules, unlike the states or China, is going to become the de facto global determinator of um, trade and carbon. And we will just have to follow. We'll be, we'll be on, uh, on the sidelines. Um, but I am, I think the perfect can be the enemy of the good in this, and it might be possible to do some things on that. But I completely agree with Manette that if we ask our farmers to do things better, then they need to be rewarded in some ways. And that can be either done by tariffs at the border or by defining that extra bit as a merit good, which I think then will persuade the hard men at the Treasury that that deserves some money going in. Ian? 
how do we see it? Well, I don't think, I think, you know, shoppers and consumers set standards, not regulators. Regulators follow. Um, and as Minette said earlier, the, you know, the, the fact that 20 years ago there was, there were, you know, big holes in our capacity to stand up our standards uh, was a, a reason why change has happened. So I'm I'm moderately optimistic. I've got to be a bit careful about this because I am on the Trade and Agriculture Commission, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm bound by the confidentiality of what it's going to say. And we're very very close. I think I can say this: we're very close. Probably one meeting, two meetings away from producing the final report. So um, I'd rather not get into the debate about what will happen on standards. But I, I'm I'm you know I'm pretty confident about the UK's ability in terms of its sort of uh, openness. Um, I, 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 I go back to the point I made earlier. If, we, if everyone signs the Paris Accords and if everyone signs up at COP26 to a, even moderately ambitious targets of, uh, on climate change, everybody's gonna be making these changes at the same time. And that will lead to a different, a kaleidoscope of different responsibilities and different vulnerabilities. Um, and I also, just on what Charles said about Europe being the effectively the arbiter of trade, I think that's right. But I think we're going to have three big blocks, aren't we, for a period? We're going to, and maybe others will emerge. But we're going to have the EU, we're going to have China, and we're going to have America. And they will get into a competition on some of these things. And we have chosen to be uh, an independent coastal state, whatever one of those is. Um, and, um, you know, one of, I suppose, the advantages that we have, and I bet you're going to ask us later something about this, but one of the advantages is, incidentally, I should tell everybody, it's, some of the colleagues were, Richard very kindly, indicated the question areas and I'm afraid I put my finger in, fingers in my ears and said la 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 because I'm very worried about uh, rehearsing answers it always sounds terrible and when I do it but I um, so I don't know what's coming <laughs> but um, I do think that one of the advantages of our current of our new status is that we can be nimble on some of this stuff and I, I th and we're also if we if we're careful we can also be an honest broker certainly between the EU and the US and potentially with China as well. So I think there's, I think there's opportunity here as well. Quick question come up on the chat line, Ian, to you, but if you can give me a quick answer, please. Bob Gooderham asked, we plant trees while other, others cut them down and we import cheap fruit from those same countries. Bit of a dilemma really, isn't it? Well, yes, but the truth is that, you know, that show business, when you've got a market economy and when you've got the, um, the situation we have, which we were talking about earlier with the preponderance of focus on cheap food, and, and I'm afraid, you know, that is one of the things we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to educate shoppers and consumers that there are other factors in the total cost of food. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next one, we haven't mentioned it yet, Brexit. What will the positives and negatives be for UK agriculture post-Brexit? That's from David Hutchinson, Mark Holford and Colin Rayner. Who wants to volunteer for that one? Hands up. Charles, is that your hand just gone up? It isn't, but someone's got to go first. Um, what I would say is that whatever you voted uh, however many years ago, uh, we are where we are. So it, one just looks ahead and looks uh, how best to do things. Uh, I think Ian's already made the point about nimbleness and we've seen that. Uh, actually, we've seen that in around some of the vaccine preparedness of things. And I think there is a real opportunity there. Um, I think what we can do with the replacement of a single farm payment is potentially really exciting. It could go horribly wrong. And um, I, I do feel for the businesses that will suffer for it. But were we to get it right, uh, one could come out to something which is infinitely better than the common agricultural policy. Um, it has to be done gently. It has to be bring the industry along with it. But that to me is the, um, is, is the biggest pro. 
I won't go into the trade frictions. Manette's already uh, mentioned them and knows far more about me, but that's clearly in the agricultural sector the biggest con. Pros and cons of Brexit, Manette? It was a massive, massive relief after four years of, of um, talking about no deal being catastrophic, which I absolutely stand by because it, it would have been disastrous for the goods sector, particularly for agriculture. So to get a trade cooperation agreement that was tariff and quota free was really good news. But, you know, being out of the single market, being out of the customs union was always going to mean a level of friction. I, I think that level of friction, there are many things that can be done to overcome it, but there will be cost. There is cost. AHDB have modelled, I think, between four and eight percent of extra costs. And what we are seeing, both with fishing, uh, speciality cheese makers, is where you've got groupage on trucks, on lorries, you've got problems. And you know, that is that is a major challenge, and we've seen it really playing out for, for fishing. But ultimately, we've got to get to more of a sort of wholesale approach where we're splitting loads when, when they've arrived. And I think there is a way of overcoming that. The veterinary side of things is holding up. Uh, the digital approach has got a long way to go, but it will get there. So I think there is going to be quite a few bumps in the road, and there are bumps in the road, but they are manageable, and I think we'll get to a much better place. But Ian, as with Terry, my director general, sits on the F4 and uh, is, is the man in the hot seat on this. He'll be able to give you all the answers about friction because he's been involved <laughs> since day one. <laughs> Did I hear any pros in your list there, Minette? Well, it is a massive pro to be to be trading tariff and quota free with the EU. <laughs> is that not a win? That's we were doing that before, though. <laughs> yeah, but but look, we faced. I mean, if we take barley as an example, we were going to loss of market access was going to be something like hundred pounds a hectare, forty eight percent tariff on lamb. We were priced out of the market. That and, is uh, what a Brexiteer Brexiteer campaigned for to have what he had before. Well, look, there were three things. It was going to be the easiest trade deal in history. Well, it turned out to be the toughest blooming trade deal in history. That is a certainty that was played right down to the wire. It was going to be a bonfire of regulation. Well, you only need a quick glance at the 133 clauses in the Environment Bill to realise it isn't a bonfire of regulation. And there was going to be a lot more money because it wasn't going into the NHS. Well, I think we all agree now that all the money is going into the NHS, and rightly so. And by the way, our national debt now sits at 2.13 trillion. So the offer <laughs> on the bus is not where we are now. So, Ian, I'm going to hold back a minute. Darren. Uh, yeah, so I suppose there's two things which I would say. One is building off what Charles has said around the single farm payment. So I remember being an, an arable farmer in the about 2005 when uh the the basic payment went to from you know an arable area payment to uh being paid to uh but not having to plant the crop and i think what that that generated that was was entrepreneurism so i think one of the things that we need to see from uh from our from our farmers and our landowners is that entrepreneurism coming to the fore notwithstanding some of the challenges i think the the, you know, one of the big opportunities is thinking about timber production. Um, you know, we import a huge amount of timber at the moment, and if we get it right in terms of the the markets for things like house building in the right places, then I think there's a market opportunity um, in that. I think the other the other potential negative though is the uh, the, the import risk that we will be bringing in. From a, from a woodland perspective, uh, imported trees to meet our net zero targets and our, you know, one of the things that the Woodland Trust has done is set up the accreditation scheme, which from a nursery uh, perspective is to grow the trees here and have them sourced and grown and therefore avoid the potential threats of things like ash dieback that will cost billions to, uh, to our natural environment and our economy. Um, and what we've seen as an organization, you know, real challenges of getting trees between uh, England, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well, okay. you know, just in the, just during this period. And I think getting those things right uh, is going to be crucial because we were kind of promised that they would be easy. And what's been proven is that they're not. Okay, Minette, I'll be with you in a second. Ian, 
minutes, then you're the expert in this area. So I'm only going to give you one option. You've got to tell us what the positives are. <laughs> oh. um, well, I'm tempted, uh, for the only time in my life, I'm tempted to agree with Martin McGuinness, who said on the day after the, the vote, you know, somebody asked him what the positives were, and he said there aren't any. Um, I think there are, I think tariff-free access is fantastic. Uh, we, we had that be... before. You can't tell. You can't sell that. Well, we nearly time. lost it. We did nearly lose it. And <laughs> don't, forget the, don't forget, don't forget, the had prime minister. The, club. That cannot the prime be minister possible. told us. The prime minister told us a week before the deal that it would be perfectly all right to have tariff. I know. Uh, Ian, I'm waiting for the list of positives. And well, that is it's, 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 not being shot in both knees is a positive. Having what we had before. <laughs> having what we had before is the only positive. Uh, no, well, there are positive. Right, I mean, further down the track, and I think this is the this is the bit we can't really judge to be overly fair to the deal. I, I mean, let me just before I tell you this, let me tell you, I I spent an hour and a half on a call with one of the country's largest manufacturers today, who told me that they told me one story which really filled me with horror. One is that they've got a regular three three times a week consignment that goes to the EU. Uh, which had, includes some stuff that's come in the day before from the EU and is re, re you know, goes out logistically, some of which they manufacture themselves. It used to take them two and a half hours to do the, uh, to do the paperwork. So far, it's taken them five days as, at a minimum. That's the first thing. The second thing is I, I was to the same manufacturer, different place, different product, three SKUs, 40 pieces of paper. So, you know, the, the, the scale of the, of the bureaucratic problem is massive. The positive is that once we are through this, if we are through this, is that the nimble uh, fleet of foot opportunity for an independent coastal state is significant. And as Charles rightly says, I think we have just seen that about the vaccine, actually. I think there are some questions about whether that you know how responsible that is and maybe that bleeds into Singapore on Thames which is a future that must mean lower regulation which in our industry is not something I suspect we particularly want because a lot of those regulations are about safety. Can I, can I, I, call, it, can I call it Ian? I, we've got lots of other questions. Sorry yeah, yeah. Net, I just think there aren't many. There aren't no. many but one of them is one of them is that if you are fleet of foot commercially there may be opportunities here later. Yeah, for the future. Minette, quickly. Well, given the question time is, is all about interruption, perhaps, or not. Um, and, I, and I agree with everything that Darren said on, on trees and, I, and growing our own nursery stock. Yes, yes, yes. But set aside was absolutely disastrous. And it's when the NFU with others brought the campaign for the farmed environment to life to try and hang on to Hillary Benn and stop him delivering on unilateral set aside. And this country, you know, is broke. We cannot afford to just set aside land. I spent my teenage years topping it, thousands and thousands of acres. There was nothing in it. It was a barren landscape. It was absolutely disastrous. We want to have thriving, profitable food producing businesses that can set land aside for nature. We do not want to go back to the ghastly era of set aside. Good point. Right. We're going to come then to one that is for you, Minette. And I'm only going to read this question verbatim. So this is not Richard Whitlock, he's just the reader. The government has given in to pressure from the NFU to reintroduce neonicotinoids on sugar beet, despite evidence showing this is harmful to bees. The government said they would maintain the ban after Brexit unless the evidence on its harmful effect has changed. Has it? And another question wrapped in with that. Will the government support the future approval by UK scientists of chemicals such as glyphosate? Now, you won't be surprised. This is a combination from Stuart Lesage and Richard and David Butler. Minette, you've, you've won the battle on Neonix. Well done. Is that good, though, for bees? Oh, goodness, this is such a... I, I'm going to have to try and answer it quickly, or I shall use up the whole of this debate answering this question. Um, Beet growers, virus yellow, I mean, we've seen losses like we've never seen before. Um, and it is a massive problem, not just here, but in Europe. So you've got the vast majority of the beet growing countries in the EU that have gone for an emergency use authorization and got it. And that speaks volumes. 
We have been very careful to purely focus on sugar beet. We have worked up a rotation to make sure that the load on the soil is minimized. So you cannot plant oilseed break straight after in that rotation. So we are the only country, I believe, that the proposal has been put together with this comprehensive rotation in place. Um, when we look at, at our, our, our sugar manufacturing in this country, British Sugar Silver Spoon, 50% of our cakes, biscuits, our home use is made with British sugar beet. The most efficient, the most environmentally friendly sugar beet sector in the world. Now, were we gonna say, right, that's it. We'll just end the beet industry. We've already got growers who've been growing for six generations who are saying we're out. We've already got that happening. And or were we going to try and build a bridge to the future, the potentials of, of gene editing and the opportunities that mean that we can we can use less chemicals, less aphicides? Were we going to build a bridge to that? And that is what this emergency use authorization is all about. It's a technical uh, application for that emergency use, exactly the same as what the Soil Association did a few months ago. And it will ultimately lead to saving the beet sector. Um, those that have challenged it, beet is non-flowering. They're going to be non-flowering in the rotation. So we don't believe it is a threat to bees. The science, I might add on this subject, is really divided. If you speak to the Australians, they are using nic neonicotinoids. They are absolutely adamant that there is no threat to soil load, that there is no threat to bee health. The Argentinians in exactly the same place on the science. So we've got to follow the science. We've got to follow the evidence. The science is as yet undecided and the proposal, the authorization was for bee only. And it will make sure that we keep 50% of sugar production going. Otherwise, back to standards again, Richard, if we lose that, we import sugar produced to much lower standards, and that is immoral, unfair, and ultimately puts our farmers out of business. And that is what we were determined to avoid. And I quite happily will stand up and have that conversation with anybody, because when you explain it, I think it shows real leadership, and it means that we can maintain the beet sector, the sugar production in this country. Darren, you being CEO of an NGO, environmental NGO, how do you how do you sit when it comes to the balance of uh, food versus nature with uh, the use of these types of chemicals? Uh, well, I think I, I'm you know a scientist by by training, and I would go with the evidence. And I think th the answer to the question that you that you posed, Richard, was uh, I think as the evidence changed, and I I think the you know in my understanding it, it hasn't the the rationale for uh, for the impact of neonicotinoids on the bee population, I think, is uh, is strong, and it's not a good good impact. And therefore, we, you know, do we want to be producing our food in a way which we know which will harm a fundamental building block of the food chain of so many things uh, across the uh, across the UK and across the across the world? And my, you know, my view would be we shouldn't. But it yeah, won't yeah. affect, sorry, it won't affect bee health because bee is non-flowering. That is the key point. The crisis we do face is that we don't have enough flowering crops for the current bee population. That is the crisis that we face. Ian, your members are, in, are importing neonic treated oilseed rape from uh, places like Ukraine, Australia. Uh, they've got a thriving bee population in some of those countries as well. How are you going to deal with this dilemma? Richard, Richard, I'm not remotely qualified to answer this question. Are you not? I mean, I, I, all I can tell you is that, that the, um, when, I'm sorry to say this with two such distinguished scientists on the uh, panel, but my experience of having run, helped run a massive business, two massive businesses, one of them in pharmaceuticals, um, is that when some, and I think this has been the problem throughout the uh, COVID crisis, when somebody says follow the science, it's actually not a straightforward thing to do. Um, I, I, I simply don't know the answer to this question. Uh, and I think those who make these judgments have to weigh the responsibility to the long-term future of the planet, which we've been talking about all evening. Uh, we, have, we have a similar problem with the COVID debate on following the Exactly. Can I and I think, 
we've got to be really careful here. Okay. Could I just come in on there, Richard? Yeah. Uh, two very brief points, because like Manette, I could speak for, for, for uh, hours on this. <laughs> I think it's a really, really difficult issue, and it's right at the cusp between the, the benefits for the farmers, the benefits for the environment. So I don't think it's black and white. I think it's really grey. It's interesting other countries in Europe ha have done it. Uh, Mineta, I disagree slightly. I, I think that the science on neonics isn't too bad and it is getting better. The problem is it has become politicised in, in, place, in places. So the issue is really a policy issue, how you weigh, weigh the, um, the benefits to the farmers against the benefits to the environment. And very briefly, I think what this tells us is we have to, in the next decade or so, get away from these small molecule poisons. We have to invest in modern forms of pest management and crop protection. There are lots of fascinating ideas out there. It needs radical more money going into the research, but it also needs a change in the public's acceptability because some of these novel approaches are GM. And what do you want? Do you want us pumping small molecule poisons into the environment or do, or will one allow to do genetic modifications? I'm it's gonna, a really hard issue. I'm going to close that one because we are, I am conscious of time and I've got one and I want short answers from you, please. A question from Philip Dolbeer. If the panelists could be prime minister for a day, what one action would they take for the future of British farming? We can call it food and farming, Ian. There you go. Uh, Minette. Oh, gosh. All right. Who else? <laughs> Hands up. A volunteer. No, I, I'm happy to answer, Richard. I just the thought of a short answer is a bit <laughs> alarming. <laughs> well, I, if I was in charge for a day, I'd have a lot to do. I, I'd, I'd sort of, um, I, I'd rewrite the current agricultural policy uh, and make sure that, that is is fit for purpose. You'd have an executive order like Biden, I expect, wouldn't you? Absolutely. So we'd be sustainable food production. We'd be leading the world. I'd uh, match fund the levy investment in AHDB. I'd look for all the uh, global opportunities that there will be if we do that. I'd be ambitious for our sector on the world stage. I'd want to lead a, a global blueprint for sustainable food production and drive massive change in the WTO. And, th and that would be in the first hour. And, yeah, well uh, done. Thank you, Darren. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, beyond planting planting a tree, uh, I think the uh, I minette's mean, covered quite a lot of it. I would, uh, uh, I would make sure that we had a land use policy that recognised the true value that every inch of the UK could deliver for wider society and rewarded it on that basis. So not... Uh, not start with a blank sheet of paper, but actually make sure that we don't simply start from what we did yesterday and carry on doing it tomorrow. Ian? I try and find a way where every Secretary of State could have access to and be literate in good scientific advice. I think one of the problems we have is that we have a whole bunch of politicians who, have, who gave up science and only did o-level biology and then failed it um the they were listening in those lessons sometimes yeah no they were doing something else and i can imagine what it was uh and the other thing that i would do is that i would uh i would spend far more time on creating particularly for farming and food i uh, the food and drink sector council is a good start but i think you need a proper advisory board of people who actually do this stuff and you need to listen to them charles you're inside DEFRA science. What could we do to change it for agriculture? External advisory group. Uh, two things. One, you'd expect me to say this as a pointy-headed scientist, but invest more in research going ahead and invest in a way that better encourages blue sky thinking and innovation. Secondly, maintain that 3.2 billion going into the rural economy and do it in a way that transitions over a period of 10 years or so into something that is genuinely a sophisticated public money for public good. Thank you very much. Now, I am not going to ask a question. Is there any, each of you, I'd just like you to leave the audience with a closing comment. So who wants to go first? Uh, Ian, let's go with you first. Well, I mean, I must be nearer the end than the beginning of my time as Food and Drink Federation Chief Executive. Um, and I would just say that you, everyone here, should have much more confidence in the importance of our industry. 
whether it be farming or food manufacturing or importing or retail or out of home. This is the most crucial in industry to the continuation of human existence, even more crucial in many ways than the medical profession, because unless you eat or drink, you ain't going to continue. And I think we should have more co confidence in ourselves and with that, more responsibility about the way we manage our industry. Thank you. Darren? Uh, I suppose as, a, as an organisation that works with a huge number of farmers uh, and will help them to plant millions of trees in the, in the years to come, um, I would say uh, let's do more of that together co and collectively. I think we have an opportunity to put a capital asset in the ground which will, will grow on that investment year on year. So whether you're interested in clean air, clean water, flood alleviation, food production, animals and nature, or all of the above, we've got a solution for you. And somebody invented it a very, very long time ago, and it didn't have to come out of a bottle. Charles, good hope for the future. So I'm going to be a Pollyanna and look forward to a time when the farming industry, the environmental community, come with a common set of goals and ambitions. Thank you very much. Leaving you till last minute. What would you like to leave us with? Well, I applaud what Charles has just said, because I think that campaign that came together last year, you saw environmental NGOs, you saw farmers, you saw chefs and you saw consumers all come together in the same cause. And if we can continue uh, with that focus, uh, I, I think the future is bright. Look, Richard, farming has changed over millennia. It will continue to evolve. I, I genuinely think that those are prepared to embrace change going forward. Uh, will have a huge amount of opportunity, but we must not forget life is going to be very different, very, very different to what it was before. And we need to really have our finger on the pulse as we move forward. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Now, if you would all please click your mute and your video buttons and we will leave Jeremy then to... Thank you very much, Richard. Well, follow that as they say. How, how lucky have we all been this evening to uh, listen and witness the interesting uh, wisdom of, of the panel. Um, uh, my takeaway phrase of the evening, when I'm feeling low, I shall take Ian's not being shot in both knees is a positive. <laughs> That's my takeaway phrase. Uh, what a wonderful evening. Uh, we've had uh, knowledge, wisdom and uh, a great deal of experience. There have seldom been times when our industry needs that sort of thing more. I must say thank you to our gallant assistant Clark Duncan who's been behind the scenes all the time making sure this evening has functioned very well. Uh, the next event you might be interested uh, to tune into is the annual City Food Lecture given this year by Melanie Smith who's the chief executive of Ocado or Ocado. Uh, that's on the 10th of February at 4.45 p.m. You can Google it. So it just remains for me to thank the panel, our illustrious chairman, Richard, uh, the master of the Worshipful Company of Farmers uh, for everything and your kind attention and questions uh, for this evening. And we look forward to seeing you all again in the future and good night. <laughs>